Today's session is being presented to you by two high caliber attorneys I've had the privilege to work with myself. Um, both of them are from the firm of Markowitz Herbold out of Portland. It's Laura Salerno Owens and Kyle Busey. And I wanna take a few minutes just to tell you both about them and their firm, um, particularly because the firm has been kind enough to sponsor today's session. Laura is the president of Markowitz Herbold and a shareholder at the firm. She's the chair of the firm's employment practice group where she has represented employers and executives in hundreds of high stakes employment issues. She also practices general business litigation and is a member of the firm's Bet the Company and Government Practice Group. Laura is widely recognized as a thought leader in the business and legal community. Some of her recent recognition includes top 100 legal influencers in the United States by the Business Journal, Oregon Women of Achievement Honoree by the Oregon Commission for Women, Women of Influence Honoree by the Portland Business Journal, and 40 Under 40 Honoree by the Portland Business Journal. And Kyle is an exceptionally gifted and recognized attorney himself. He has more than 14 years of experience litigating all manner of employment related cases on behalf of both employers and individuals. He's a fixture in super lawyers and best lawyers in America for employment law and litigation. He was recently named the best lawyers in America 2020 Portland lawyer of the year for employment law. In addition to his experience advising employers and litigating employment claims, Kyle's broad state and federal practice includes complex commercial and class action litigation as part of the firm's Bet the Company and Government Practice Groups. And outside the courtroom, he is recognized as a skilled negotiator of executive contracts and a thoughtful advocate in resolving contract disputes and non-competition agreements. Markowitz Herbold is a business litigation firm that has been representing both cities and counties for more than 30 years. The firm's government group includes more than half of the attorneys in its firm, some of whom have served in government themselves, including Anna Joyce, who is the former Solicitor General for the state of Oregon. The team brings a rare combination of firsthand experience and well-rounded perspective that enhances and hones its ag advocacy. The firm's lawyers understand the implications of cases involving intense public scrutiny and high stakes and strategizes to deliver the strongest case before a state federal court arbitrator or administrative board. The firm has deep experience in many practice areas important to cities, including employment disputes, class actions, construction defects, contract disputes, development agreements, defamation, energy law, false claim act matters, first amendment issues, ethics, public records requests, and RICO, and that's just to name a few. And from a personal perspective on behalf of the league, the league has used this firm several times in the past with great success. Um, I've personally worked with Harry Wilson and Anna Joyce. They filed amazing amicus briefs on behalf of the League of Oregon Cities, which means they've done so on behalf of everyone on this call. And we've currently retained the firm to help us write a chapter in our municipal handbook related to First Amendment. So on behalf of the League of Oregon Cities, I wanna thank the firm for sponsoring the session. And I really wanna thank Laura and Kyle for their presentation today. I've seen you present before, it's going to be exceptional. Uh, if you have questions, everyone, put them in the chat. I will monitor those and then I will relay those to Laura, Laura and Kyle at the end of the session so they can get through their primary materials. But Laura and Kyle, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Patty. Really appreciate that warm introduction. And uh, good morning, everyone. So great to see you all. So Kyle, do you want to put up our um, slides? And while you're doing that, I just want to welcome everyone to this topic. Um, who thought or knew that we would spend so much time and energy thinking about vaccines? I know a year ago at this time, I was giving a lot of presentations about, you know, return to work considerations. What do we do about that? Spacing and elevators, et cetera. And now, of course, we're thinking about vaccine mandates. So here we are. Um, so this is, of course, a very timely topic. As many of you are aware, uh, the state mandate went into effect on Monday. So there's been a lot of media, a lot of press, a lot of questions around this. And that's gonna inform our presentation today. So I have to put out a couple of disclaimers because that's what a good lawyer does. So first, normally in our um, PowerPoints, I would not inundate you with a bunch of text, right? Um, that's boring <laughs> and you know, that's kind of presentation 101. Put in like interesting images and have some funny jokes. And normally that's what it would be. But because we really want this to be practical, um, many of you sent in questions ahead of time, which we really appreciate. We're hoping that these materials, this PowerPoint can be almost like a, a desk reference for you. Something you save on your hard drive or you print out. So we really have a lot of text on the slides. You know, here's the question, here's the answer. 
So we hope you will give us dispensation that we don't have a lot of funny memes, but um, hopefully we make up for it with useful content. So that being said, there's a lot of content in here. We're gonna try to get through it all within the hour, but if for some reason we are unable to get through all the slides or if we don't address one of your questions, which hopefully we will because we did receive questions beforehand, our last slide has our contact information. Please do not hesitate to reach out to me or Kyle or both of us with any questions you have. We're happy to answer it. That's why we're here. Okay, okay. so while we move to the next slide, Kyle, and why don't you um, let our folks know what we're gonna be covering today. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having us today. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, you'd think after a year and a half of doing this, <clears throat> we would have uh, been able to eliminate those, but I guess not. So uh, Laura said we're going to be talking about a lot today. I don't know what she's talking about. We're only going to be covering two things. One is which vaccine mandates apply to employers uh, in the state and uh, frequently asked questions. So it's really very simple until you consider the various categories of questions that we've been seeing over the past couple of months. We've got all these different kinds of requests that are coming in. Uh, we have to think about how we are going to deal with these requests, what we're going to do about falsified exemption requests, what kinds of accommodations are available to us and, what, and do we have to provide those accommodations? And, uh, and what do we do about questions related to uh, pay issues and vaccines? So hopefully, as Laura said, today's presentation is gonna give you some practical tools to use uh, when you're dealing with these questions. Um, and, uh, and as Laura said, if you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. So to get us started, I'm going to turn it over to Laura to discuss the threshold question of how the vaccine mandates apply to your city. Okay, so let's just jump in. Let's go to the next slide. Big question, does the state of Oregon mandate apply to cities? So the executive order issued by the governor. And the answer, you know, I would just put no, <laughs> but there are some, there could be a way that it does. So I put instead a lawyerly answer only in very limited circumstances. So again, just to level set, the mandate applies to healthcare workers, teachers, or state executive branch employees in Oregon. And I think a source of confusion for a number of city workers and particularly the media, of course, is whether city employees are state executive branch employees in Oregon. And the answer is no, they are not. So that section of the mandate is not gonna apply to city employees. Um, where it could be is, for instance, if the city does employ some healthcare workers, um, then those employees would be subject to this mandate. But as a general matter, cities are not going to be covered by the state of Oregon mandate. Now, that being said, just so you are aware of what the mandate provides, that is the one that went into effect on Monday that has received a lot of attention. Um, if you have employees who are unionized, then they have until November 30th to get vaccinated. I think the, the most um, noteworthy thing has been, it does not allow for testing as an alternative. So that has been, um, a, I think, a source of a lot of uh, questions and controversy, but that is, that's the rule. And that is different than the federal mandate, which we'll talk about in a moment. Now, that being said, even though there is not testing as an alternative and you must be vaccinated, there are, of course, still exemptions there are medical and religious exemptions. And that's a whole ball of wax into itself that we'll get into in a moment. So now the next issue is, okay, well, what about the federal OSHA mandate that we've been hearing about, you know, that President Biden announced that apply, does that apply to cities who employ more than 100 people? Because of course the federal mandate does not apply to employers with fewer than 100 employees. And the answer to this is, is yes, it does. But that is for a specific reason. Now, some of you uh, scholars in the audience might be thinking, well, what is she talking about? You know, federal OSHA doesn't apply to cities. And normally, yes, that is correct. However, because Oregon is different, we are one of 26 states that has a federally approved state OSHA plan. So what that essentially means is that whatever OSHA plan our state has, has to be coextensive to a, a, a minimum with the federal plan. So if the federal OSHA requires that all employers, more than 100 people have vaccine mandates, 
so too must our state OSHA plan. So under this federal mandate, um, here's the requirement. Employees are required to get a COVID vaccine or alternatively, they can submit to weekly testing. So that is different. Um, then you still have medical and religious exemptions. Um, I see a question, do EMTs count as healthcare workers? And the answer is yes. Um, so then you have medical and religious exemptions and the rule has not yet issued. So the deadline that is to be determined, this rule is not gonna go into effect until OSHA prognates the rules. And we suspect just as they've done in the past that there's likely gonna be a grace period of several months. We also hope and expect that there will be an extensive frequently asked questions that come out. Many of you may recall last year when um, the laws were being passed about COVID requirements, there was a really extensive FAQ that's quite helpful. We hope that will happen here again. Important point that I think sometimes gets overlooked, and this might apply to some of your administrative staff. This mandate does not apply to fully remote employees who do not come into the office. So if you have someone that can work completely from home, they're not required to be vaccinated or otherwise submit to weekly testing. Okay, so now the next question, and this might apply to many of you on the line. What do you do if your city is not covered by the state mandate, right? We're not talking about healthcare workers, teachers, you know, state executive branch employees, okay? And you employ fewer than 100 people, so you are not subject to the federal OSHA mandate. So in that case, um, then what? Well, the answer is you can impose your own vaccine mandate. You know, you can, and we'll talk about that in a moment, just like any other employer would, but you will be subject to certain limitations. And let's walk through what those limitations are. The first one is, and I think this is the big one that people have had in mind, because this has been the law in Oregon for some time, which is ORS 433.416 sub 3 prohibits employers from making immunization a condition of employment for certain workers, as that term is defined in another statute. So that basically means that you as a city cannot require healthcare workers, police, fire, probation, and correction officers to be vaccinated. Okay. But then recall that this healthcare workers piece from the statute is going to be exempted because they are subject to the vaccine mandates because of the executive order. And Justice Landau wrote a really nice letter opinion that came out on October 7th. And we can share that with everyone, explaining why the um, executive order applies. And the, the basic answer is that there is language in ORS 433.416 on this prohibition of vaccinations that say, you can't require these employees to be vaccinated unless otherwise required by state law, rule, or regulation. And there is a state law that says the governor can pass executive orders and those have the force of law. And so that is the interplay as to why healthcare workers are still required to be vaccinated, notwithstanding this Oregon statute. Um, he also gives good explanations as to why this is not prohibited by Oregon constitution. I think it's very well written. And while I don't normally uh, advise people to read Supreme Court opinions <laughs> or to read these other opinions, I think it's useful because it gives you some language if you need to have these conversations with your employees. And that's one of my and Kyle's main goals is just to give you some information on talking points because we think a lot of what creates these problems around the vaccine issue is misinformation or incomplete information. Okay, and that being said, just final point on this. Um, we've received some questions about, well, what about essential workers? Do they have to be vaccinated or not? And the whole concept of essential worker was very relevant when we were talking about closure orders. You know, who still must come in, who doesn't, so on and so forth. But that term has not carried over into the vaccine mandates. So essential workers are not a separate category for vaccine mandates. So unless someone is police, fire, probation, or correction officer, you can require them to be vaccinated if you have such a policy. And if they're a healthcare worker, then they must be vaccinated under the state mandate. So uh, other things to keep in mind is if you do decide to have your own vaccine mandate, um, requiring employees to be vaccinated does not present a discrimination problem. That's a common question we've gotten. I'm being discriminated against, this is unfair. Um, that has not been upheld. It's not a discrimination problem. So you can require employees to be vaccinated. Um, 
Second, and we'll talk about this in more detail later when we get to the commonly asked questions, there are no HIPAA concerns with requiring vaccination records or proof of testing of your employees because HIPAA only applies to healthcare providers. It doesn't apply to employers. So it's not an employer employee context issue, even though that comes up a lot. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. And then finally, of course, even if you decide to have your own vaccine mandate, um, you still have to make an exception for religious and medical requests. And Kana will go into that much more detail in the slides to come. But that is your big picture, high level overview. I know we move quickly. The slides will be available afterwards. And of course, feel free to reach out to us with questions. So with that, I will turn it to Kyle to dive into some of the questions that we've received. Thanks, Laura. Okay, now that we know how the mandates apply to you, let's get into the most common questions we've been getting from employers and employees about whether and how exemptions are going to be applied. So we're gonna start with the most frequent type of exemption request, which is religious exemptions. I have to say that we have seen the gamut of religious exemption requests in the past couple of months from the perspective of both employer and employee. We've had employees call to ask exactly what they should say. And we've had employers call to ask whether they should believe what their employees are saying. Uh, the best approach in any situation uh, is to begin at the same starting point, which is to determine whether this is actually a religious objection as opposed to a political, scientific, or other personal objection. So what counts as a religious objection? Uh, I'll note here, this is not an exhaustive list by any means. Uh, this is based on actual experiences we've had answering questions from employers and employees about whether their particular situation would qualify for an exemption on the basis of religion. Um, so there are many, many more options than this. But uh, here are a few by way of example. So on the left, we have what would be considered religious objections, uh, moral discomfort, with the use of stem cells in vaccine research, uh, belief that receiving the vaccine constitutes the mark of the beast. That's something that uh, a question I answered just the other day. Uh, adherence to a religion that prohibits all vaccinations like a Jehovah's Witness. Um, these are all considered religious objections for the purposes of a religious exemption request. And we're not here to comment on the validity of these objections. Neither should you. Simply be aware that if you get a religious exemption request based on any of these objections or others that are uh, based in religion, uh, you should consider those a legitimate objection and look for an accommodation. And on the right, we have what would not be considered religious objections for the purposes of these religious exemption requests. Those include feeling that the vaccine was developed too quickly. It's a common belief, um, but not based on religion. Uh, a belief that mandates are government overreach, also a very common belief. A disagreement with the science of vaccines and uh, preferring to rely on natural immunity. Now I'll say with the last one, the preferring to rely on natural immunity, that could have some crossover with a sincerely held religious belief because there are uh, religions that believe in natural immunity. And so you have to be careful there. You want to take these on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, if you want a second opinion, you can always give one of us a call or any other uh, employment lawyer a call, but, um, but there will be some potential crossover. So just be really careful about that. Again, we're not commenting on uh, whether these are legitimate political or scientific beliefs. Um, but these would not be considered religious objections, the ones on the right, for purposes of these religious exemption requests. And so this leads to the next question we get from many employers, which is, how am I supposed to evaluate the legitimacy of a religious exemption request? You know, for medical and disability exemptions, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, there is at least usually some sort of tangible evidence of those uh, uh, of the disability or of the medical condition. You can get a doctor's note. Uh, you can describe the physical impairment that prevents you from being vaccinated. These are things that you can actually um, discuss in a tangible way 
um, as opposed to a religious exemption, which is harder to demonstrate because it's about your faith and what's uh, what's in your head. Um, so uh, how do we do this? Well, the incredible thing is we actually have a form for that. Um, I have to say, I was pretty surprised when the Oregon Health Authority came out with an actual government uh, approved form for employers to use for these ex uh, religious exemption requests. Um, you can get it at the uh, website that we've noted on this slide and we'll provide you with the slides. So don't worry about scribbling that down right now, but let's take a look at this form. Uh, here it is. Uh, what the form is doing is asking the employee to give a brief written description of their religious objection to the vaccine and to certify that they're being truthful about having this sincerely held religious belief. I really like this form. Uh, what I like about it is that it kind of takes the employer out of the equation. Civil rights issues are often very emotional. These are highly personal beliefs that don't always mix well with office dynamics. Uh, so the less involvement from individuals who represent the employer, the better, because there's less chance that someone will be perceived by the employee of holding some kind of bias or being judgy, to use a technical term, uh, about all of this. I really like that OHA becomes the questioner on this form rather than the employer. I also like that there's a certification. It, it doesn't mean that an employee can't lie, but I think it's just a little bit harder when you have to swear to it. Finally, I really like that the form explains that the employer is not required to provide an, un, an uh, accommodation if there's an undue hardship uh, or if the accommodation would pose a direct threat. Uh, I like that the form explains this rather, the, rather than the employer. Uh, all in all, I think this is a great document. I, I encourage using this for religious exemption requests. Um, but, uh, but we do get a follow-up question sometimes, which is, can we make them fill this out? And the answer is yes, you can. You can make them fill this form out. You can make them uh, fill out a, a less formal uh, narrative uh, describing their religious belief and the basis for it. Um, for the reasons we just discussed, I like this form a lot. Uh, I think that it's really good to depersonalize this, uh, this back and forth. And so I would encourage the form, but you can do it in a less formal way if you want to. Uh, but what if you get this form or some more informal narrative and you still have questions? Can you ask follow-up questions after getting the uh, initial response? And the answer again is yes. Uh, this can be very much like a request for a disability accommodation. Uh, you probably already know uh, there's a lot of back and forth when it comes to accommodation requests in the disability arena. This is called the interactive process. Um, uh, the Oregon Health Authority has made it pretty clear that they want uh, employers to engage in the interactive process in this context as well. And just like with the interactive process, though, we want to make sure these conversations are uh, being kept confidential. We want to make sure that we are keeping a written record that is stored in the medical file, not in the regular employee file. And we also only want to do what is necessary to determine the religious objection and the basis for that objection. Don't go digging too deep into the employee's personal life. Um, it's going to start feeling like harassment if you do that. And, and we don't need to get sued for discrimination or harassment on top of everything else we have going on. So, uh, so that's the best way to handle it. You want it to be get enough to make the decision, but don't go too far. Uh, and, and then that brings us to a, a big question that we get a lot and which I think is legitimate based on some of the uh, calls I've had with employees who are seeking to avoid being vaccinated. And that is, uh, what do we do if we just don't believe what the employee is telling us? And uh, there isn't much you can do. Uh, you really do need to err on the side of granting the exemption in this context. The only time I would advise an employer to deny an exemption is if there is some objective evidence that contradicts what the employee is saying. Um, for example, if the employee says that he doesn't believe in vaccines generally, but you know for a fact that the employee gets the flu shot every year, that would be an example. 
Um, you know, if the employee has always said that they just aren't religious and they don't believe in Christianity and then they come in and all of a sudden they uh, won't get the vaccine based on the Christian faith, that would be something that, um, you know, could raise eyebrows and, and cause you to dig a little deeper. But, you know, short of that kind of thing, it's going to be really difficult to justify denying a religious exemption. Um, that is otherwise based, or a request that is otherwise based on what seems like a truly religious objection. If you do get uh, some of some some kind of explanation and you have evidence to contradict it, uh, and you decide that you want to deny the request, uh, you know it'll sound like a broken record here, but just make sure that the reason for denial is clearly documented, so that if it comes down to litigation, you can explain exactly what went into the thinking. Uh, when it comes to that denial. And uh, it's also important to emphasize that the reason for denial can't be that you disagree with the religious belief or that you think it's silly that an employee thinks a certain way. The basis of the denial really does need to be that there is no sincerely held religious belief, as long as, uh, no matter what the belief is, as long as the objection is truly religious based. So that's what to think about with regard to religious exemption requests. Uh, I think it's best to keep in mind the sensitivity of this issue and to try to think objectively about going through the steps of either granting or denying the religious exemption. Uh, try to keep the feelings and personal beliefs out of the equation as much as possible. And remember that religious discrimination is still against the law. So we need to avoid the perception that we're treating an employee adversely because of their request or because of their religion or beliefs. Um, just as a, a side note, some of you may have seen that uh, Nick Rolovich, the head football coach at Washington State University was fired on Monday for refusing to get the vaccine. Until Monday, he was the highest paid state employee in the state of Washington. And that tells you that nobody is immune from these mandates. Um, but I, I bring this up because one thing that's really interesting about that situation is uh, that the evaluation of Washington State employee exemption requests is done in the blind by a panel who doesn't know the identity of the individual requesting the exemption. Um, I find that very interesting because I see that, I think that we're gonna probably be defending against some of these decisions in the near future. Um, I think that decision to do that in the blind may end up saving the state of Washington a lot of money uh, with regard to the lawsuit that Nick Rolovich has, has said he's going to file. Um, so just something to consider as we're moving forward, getting these uh, religious exemption requests. Um, it's uh, one way to deal with it that I thought was, was interesting and worth mentioning. Okay, enough of me for a minute. I'm going to turn it back over to Laura to talk about medical exemption requests. Thanks, Kyle. And also while Kyle was talking, I've been trying to respond to the questions in the chat. I've been doing those directly to the individuals to try to keep the uh, chat box not so over full, but um, again, if anyone at the end doesn't have their questions answered, let us know. But I've been trying to respond to the questions as they've been coming up in chat. Um, can I just throw in here? I yeah. can't see the chat uh, with the presenter view, so don't be offended if you're speaking <laughs> while Laura's talking and I'm not responding uh, because I can't see them. So we'll get to them hopefully at the end here. Thanks. Okay. All right. Um, and I love the questions. Keep them coming. Thank you. Okay, medical exemption requests. So here's what I'm gonna do in this part. I just wanna walk you through the process, both for medical and disability exemptions, how you should handle this. So um, next slide, please. So the first question that we um, often get is, which medical conditions would prevent a person from getting the vaccine? And interestingly enough, and I will tell you that as a lawyer, I didn't expect to learn as much about vaccines and immunology as I have, <laughs> but for the COVID vaccines in particular, there's just one. And it's a severe allergic reaction to one of the ingredients of the vaccine, which results in anaphylaxis. So that means that even immunocompromised individuals, like for example, individuals who are undergoing chemo or pregnant women can receive the vaccine. So then that leads to the next question I usually get on that, which is really? <laughs> and the answer is yes, really. And the reason for that is that the COVID-19 vaccines don't contain a live virus the way many other vaccines do. 
And so therefore they don't present some of the same um, medical risk as other vaccines. And um, one of the questions in the chat that I didn't get a chance to get to was uh, the fact that like the J and J vaccine was not used with stem cells. And so is that a reason you could tell someone to get J and J? I think the answer is yes, right? If someone is saying that their problem is about stem cells, then you could say, okay, well, here's a vaccine that's have stem cells. I mean, it's it's fascinating how we're all learning so much about these vaccines and what they um, entail. That being said, um, you know, I am not a doctor and Kyle might go up, up one more. Um, so what we've put on here are the links to the CDC. So those are the authorities, right? So those are the links. Again, the slides will be circulated. Please check that out. Um, but that's going to provide you the information you need about why these vaccines don't have a live virus, why it's not going to present the issues for the medical conditions, except for that one very rare medical condition where some of the ingredients would cause anaphylaxis. Okay, next slide. So in that case, if someone is requesting a medical exemption, what information should you ask of your employee if they want that medical exemption? And here's the good news on this. While it is true that COVID-19 is new <laughs> and navigating these issues is new, public health and vaccines in general are not new. So for many, many years, we've had people required to have vaccines to go to school, for instance. And so on the slide is a list of information that you can request of your employee when they want a medical exemption and that is the same issue, um, same questions that schools can ask. So I won't read them all to you, it's on the slide, but I want you to be aware of that guidance. So then the next issue that comes up is, as I mentioned earlier briefly, HIPAA, right? And I'm sure many of you have heard this, well, I can't ask employees HIPAA, HIPAA, or your employee says, you can't ask me HIPAA, you know? And I'm just here, I wanted to spell that. So HIPAA, so can an employer request medical records from an employee? Yes. HIPAA does not apply to the employer-employee interactions. So you can ask the employee for medical documentation, records of COVID vaccinations or other past vaccinations. Um, if you are gonna request those records directly from their doctor or from a hospital, then you would need a medical release signed by the employee if you wanna request those records directly because those medical providers are covered by HIPAA. And so, Next slide, that's gonna just take a quick little detour. What is HIPAA? <laughs> so, you know, as you know, um, among other things, you know, HIPAA it prohibits a healthcare provider from sharing your medical information without your permission. So that's what it prevents. What it does not prevent is people asking you about your own medical information. It does not uh, protect an employee from providing it in relevant situations. And that would include here, where if an employee is requesting a medical exemption, then an employer can ask them for medical records related to that exemption. So I don't want you all to think, oh, great. OK, so now we don't need to worry about privacy. Laura said so. We're great. No, no, no. <laughs> Employers still need to worry about privacy. Um, and again, just as we do before, proceed accordingly in that employees' medical records and information should be kept confidential. Employees should be comfortable that their employer is not going to share their information with their coworkers. Um, and of course, in general, just don't use this as an opportunity to dive into their medical information, only ask for information that's relevant to the vaccine issue. And for instance, with your personnel files, you still should have a separate file, just as you would before, where if you're receiving medical information or any information related to their exemption requests or vaccine history, you're putting in that separate file. So privacy still applies, just HIPAA doesn't. And so then that leads us into a related area of disability exemption requests. And again, good news is this is not totally uncharted territory. For any of you who are subject to the ADA because you have more than 15 employees or Oregon disability accommodation law because you have more than six employees, Hopefully you're pretty used to this process of the interactive process that Kyle's describing earlier. So how do employers handle a request for a disability exemption? Exactly as you would handle a request for any other request for accommodation under the ADA. So you talk to the employee, you keep it confidential, and you offer whatever reasonable accommodations are possible. So that then of course, leads to the big question, and this is where things get a little nuanced. Well, okay, so I understand big picture, how the interactive process works and disabilities, but what disabilities would prevent, prevent someone from receiving the COVID vaccine? 
So you'll see here, I have a short answer and then a lot of text underneath, right? So hopefully that's a hint to you that this is not as simple as it might seem. So technically, none. Technically, there are no disabilities that would prevent someone from getting the COVID vaccine. But here are some things I want you to think about and keep in mind. First, the EEOC encourages employers to treat pregnancy as if it were a disability in this context, even though pregnancy is not a disability for the ADA. I was joking with Kyle earlier that I've been, I've had two kids. <laughs> I felt that it affected my major life activities. But as we all know, pregnancy within itself is not a disability in the ADA. However, in this context, because many people feel strongly that they don't want the vaccine while they're pregnant or breastfeeding, EEOC encourages employers to engage in the interactive process with that, see if there are reasonable accommodations for those employees. Um, the other thing to keep in mind too, as Kyle mentioned earlier, is you wanna be cautious on um, making sure that you engage in this process with employees because you don't wanna give rise to a discrimination claim and pregnancy discrimination is a form of sex discrimination. So if you're not even gonna engage in the interactive process within a pregnant employee, even see if there's any reasonable accommodations, that could possibly give rise to a sex discrimination claim. So we recommend doing that for your pregnant employees or breastfeeding employees. So then the question might be, okay, well, is pregnancy the only relevant disability? Well, again, no. Here are just some examples. You know, as Kyle and I are sitting here thinking of, you know, between us and our you know, 40 years of experience of like, what have we seen people come up with? People have some interesting things they might be able to come up with. So for instance, you could have an employee who has a true phobia of needles or doctor's offices, right? So if that's the case, you know, again, engage in an active process. But keep in mind, if this is an employee who's gotten a flu shot every year or has gotten vaccines before, that might cut against their statement that they have a phobia of needles and doctor's offices. Um, and second, you could have employees that have some disabilities that make it difficult for them to access the vaccine maybe mobility issues, other issues, um, getting around, um, accessing doctor's offices. Again, it seems unlikely in this day and age, but again, we just, I guess the message we wanna put across is not to be so black and white on this, but if you have an employee who says they have some sort of disability, engage in their active process, you might determine at the end, there still is no reasonable accommodation available for them. But our goal here today is to give you tips to minimize litigation or fortify your position and defense should you be sued. And engaging in that process and documenting it is going to put you in a much better position. Okay. So we've gotten a lot of questions about this, which is, uh, what do you do when you really think that this medical information that you got is false? Uh, well, you do have some options. One thing you can do is ask for medical records to support the requested exemption. Um, that is okay. You can ask for those records. As, as Laura said, that is not a violation of HIPAA. Uh, you can also ask for a phone call with the employee's primary care provider. Um, but also remember what Laura said about HIPAA. That doctor is not going to talk to you without a release of uh, information from the employee. Um, and also, just a side note here, you want to make sure that when you do get a release like that, that it's very limited in scope and specific to only what you need to know to respond to the exemption request. Uh, you, again, you don't wanna be seen as digging too deeply into your employee's personal life that never turns out well. Um, so what if the employee won't get the medical records or refuses to allow you to talk to the doctor? Well, you can deny the exemption in that case. Uh, just make sure that you document everything in writing um, and you are able to defend why you denied the exemption. Uh, you want as much detail as possible in the file about why the exemption was denied, including what information you asked for that wasn't provided. And the next issue is one that can be very controversial, uh, but, but we do get this question, can an employer require an employee to see a physician of their choosing? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, if an employer has reason to believe that the information coming from the employee's doctor is inaccurate or that the employee and the doctor are in cahoots, like if the employee's doctor is the employee's dad um, and you just don't believe what, uh, what dad is saying, then you can uh, ask the employee to see uh, an independent physician. But 
if you're going to do that, again, broken record, make sure there's documentation in the file about uh, why you're doing that. And it really should be pretty obvious why you have to do that. From a litigation standpoint, my experience is that juries don't like it when employers make an employee see a doctor who is not their own. That's just never, never a good look if you can avoid it. Okay. So let's assume you are covered by the vaccine mandate and you get one or more valid exemption requests. Uh, what, what accommodations should you consider providing? Well, um, keep in mind first, which mandate applies to you. Uh, if you're subject to the federal OSHA mandate, weekly testing is often the best accommodation. Uh, the employee can still be in the office being as productive as, as, productive as if uh, he or she had gotten the vaccine. Um, they just have to get tested every week. Uh, so, so that's, uh, you know, from a productivity standpoint, uh, often a very good option. Another option is full remote work. Laura talked about this earlier. That's a way to completely get around the mandate. Um, and if you can do that, I think we've all experienced over the last 18 months or so that uh, remote work is at least more possible than we thought it was. Um, so that can be a good option. <clears throat> also, and this is definitely not the most popular option, uh, keep in mind that unpaid leave is available where an employee can't work remotely and where testing is not an option. Um, the question we get related to unpaid leave the most is whether or not <clears throat> the employer still has to pay employee benefits. And the answer is probably yes. Uh, generally under the ADA and other civil rights laws, an employee on unpaid leave um, has uh, a right to benefit continuation. So just keep that in mind. And that can be a pretty tough pill to swallow for employers who are getting zero productivity from uh, an employee who is on unpaid leave. So it's, you know, it's, it's not always the best option. Um, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that most employees really can't afford to be on unpaid leave for very long. So this is the kind of thing that works itself out. Sounds kind of cold, but it's true. And also, you know, just from the standpoint of what is legal, that is legal. Um, and if you're subject to the state of Oregon mandate, uh, I know that uh, there are limited circumstances where cities are going to be subject to the state of Oregon mandate. But if, if uh, you've got a healthcare worker, for example, who is a uh, similar approach, except that weekly testing is not, uh, not really an option um, for uh, as an alternative to the, the vaccine in the state of Oregon context. Now, uh, that hasn't been tested yet. Nobody, as far as I know, uh, has gotten an opinion out of the courts about whether or not that's true, tried to use that as a workaround. Um, we don't believe it's a workaround, but um, it's probably something that's going to shake out pretty soon since the uh, state mandate just went into effect on Monday. And now for the really big question that we get a lot, which is, can an employee be fired for refusing to get vaccinated? Um, and we are going to give you the most unsatisfying answer possible, which is yes and no. Um, technically, yes, you can fire an employee for refusing to be vaccinated, but reasonable accommodations are required. Uh, and that means any reasonable accommodation after going through the interactive process and really making a demonstrable effort that you did so. Um, but if an accommodation is truly not possible, if we're talking about undue hardship, if we're talking about uh, direct threat, um, or in the religious accommodation context, if we're talking about more than a de minimis cost to the employer, then um, the uh, accommodation can be denied. Um, and uh, in that case, uh, the uh, employer can fire the employee. But this is really tricky. Um, you know, this is where employment lawyers are going to earn their money in the next few months um, because these things are going to shake out and we're going to find out um, really what the true boundaries are. Um, but uh, why don't we turn to another category of questions uh, that we get a lot related to testing and vaccines, uh, which is who pays? So if COVID testing <clears throat> is the option, um, the question becomes, who's going to pay for that testing? And the answer is, it depends. Um, if the testing 
is a form of accommodation under the ADA uh, or Title VII, then the employer is going to have to pay for testing. The city, in this case, will have to pay for testing um, because you're not going to be basically punishing your employee financially for going to get tested um, because of their religious beliefs or uh, a medical accommodation. Now, if the testing is a choice because the employee didn't want to get vaccinated and chose to get tested because of the OSHA mandate, then the employee would be responsible for paying for that. Um, the employer does not have to pay for government mandated testing. Now, that brings us to a trickier um, distinction, I think, in the context of cities. Um, and, and that's because there is a statute which says uh, that an employer can require an employee to pay for testing if the mandate is due to a city ordinance, and we're talking about 659A306. Well, <clears throat> because the language of the statute says ordinance, um, I think that there is uh, most likely a distinction. And again, this hasn't been tested in this context, but uh, we think that there's most likely a distinction. Uh, Laura, I'm looping you in on this, so feel free to jump in if you have anything uh, to say about it, but uh, between a city ordinance and a city policy. So if an employer who is not subject to the OSHA mandate decides to require testing uh, by policy, so not through an ordinance, then uh, we believe that the city would have to pay for that testing. But if city council passes an ordinance requiring the testing, then we believe that that would bring that into 659A306. And in that case, uh, the employee would be responsible for testing. So, uh, so that's this distinction here. You know, again, this hasn't been borne out in the courts, but uh, that would be a specific nuance that might apply to cities. So if an employer does require the vaccine, do they need to pay employees uh, for the time off to get it? And the answer is yes, they do, um, but they can uh, make the employee uh, take PTO or sick time that they've already accrued in order to do that. Um, now, keep in mind, you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you have to do something as an employer. Uh, sometimes employees really don't like to be forced to take this kind of thing if, uh, if they're required to go and get a test. But, um, and, and so sometimes it can be uh, useful to, to err on the side of, of not making them take PTO, but it's something that you can do. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Laura. Okay, so now we're getting into the question about incentives, you know, what can you do to uh, have employees get vaccinated if you want to encourage them, what can you do financially and where do you run into trouble. So, um, and this is based on questions that we've received from uh, some clients. So can employers use incentive to encourage employees to get vaccinated? And the answer is yes, but again, there are some limitations around that. So keep in mind that incentives count as a wellness program and therefore they have to comply with HIPAA wellness program requirements. I know some of you are probably thinking, but Laura, you just said HIPAA doesn't apply. <laughs> it does in this context for purposes of your wellness programs. Um, so most importantly, uh, the, the basic like bottom line thing is that the total cost of the incentive can't exceed 30% of the total employee only cost of the health insurance. So um, there's more, we provide you more information, a link to the Department of Labor uh, website on that. Hopefully if you already have some sort of incentive programs in your um, healthcare program, your health benefits, this can just plug into that. So it's the same guardrails, the same limitations, but you can have some incentives and um, that might be a positive non-punitive way to encourage employees to get vaccinated. Um, now on the next, Piece leads, of course, the next question um, for the next slide. In that case, uh, you know, 
what else can you do? <laughs> and one option is a fine. And I want to make it very clear that's not what I'm recommending, right? I don't want y'all to say, well, Laura from Markowitz said that we can fine our employees. So that's what we're doing. It's true, you can. Um, but, and, and I will say that, for instance, Delta Airlines, for example, is fining uh, pilots and flight attendants $200 per month if they don't get vaccinated. Um, and they're doing that rather than requiring them to do so. So there's no mandate. They don't have a vaccine mandate. But what they are doing is they're fining employees who don't get vaccinated. Again, I am not recommending <laughs> that's what you all go out and do. I think there could be some morale issues on that. And I think both Kyle and I would agree that in our experience, often what leads to lawsuits are these types of morale things. It could be legal, totally legal, but when people are upset, that's when they get cantankerous. That's when they think about suing. So, but it is an option. So I want to put that out there because I like to put out all range of options. Um, another question we've received is, um, what do you do on the insurance piece, right? Because now some people's insurance is going up if they have unvaccinated employees, you know, so can employers um, pass on the cost of increased insurance premiums to unvaccinated employees? And the answer is yes. And this might be a little less controversial than a fine, um, only because, for instance, I know that um, state employees, you know, Patty mentioned at the beginning, we have a number of lawyers at our firm who used to work for the state and were government employees, you know, some have shared with us that when they were at the state, there was a surcharge if you um, smoke or use tobacco products that would be added on to your insurance. Um, so, you know, typically this is done through a surcharge that's added to the employee's premium. Um, and keep in mind, these surcharges can also be assessed on spouses and domestic partners for unvaccinated and on the employee's insurance plan. Again, I'm not recommending necessarily it's what you do, but I am saying it is an option if when you sit down and you pencil this out and are thinking about how are we going to deal with this increased cost, it is an option to pass on those insurance premiums to unvaccinated employees, and that might serve as an incentive to have some employees get vaccinated. Okay, well, what can you do though if you know an employer is like, okay, I don't want to find my employee, I don't want to do any of those things. You know, what are some other options available to me? And one possibility again, sort of a you know, creating more of a benefit, more of a positive encouragement instead of a punitive one, could potentially be to increase PTO. Um, and again, people are unionized. I know it's a whole other issue. You got to deal with the union contracts. We're talking about non-unionized employees. But to increase PTO with the creation of like a floating COVID-19 holiday that they could use to get vaccinated or just to um, uh, take a day off. Um, again, as I like to joke at this point, don't we all deserve a day off <laughs> after dealing with all these issues and these vaccine headaches? So, um, so that's something else to, to keep in mind as well. Um, all right, so then moving on, what about the question of liability? right? If this is an OSHA mandate, um, can an employer be sued if their employees don't get vaccinated? And at this point, that's unclear. Obviously, there's been no case law on it. Um, but here is our best analysis based on what we know now. So if the OSHA mandate applies, right? So if you have um, more than 100 employees, and once the OSHA mandate goes into effect, you know, technically, like any other OSHA situation, an employee could file a complaint saying that you have an unsafe workplace if you're not enforcing the mandate, if you're not requiring employees to be vaccinated, which would carry the same consequences as any other OSHA complaint. Usually that's a fine. Sometimes in extreme situations, it could be a work shutdown or close down. That's pretty rare. It's usually a fine. Um, but you know, at this point, to our knowledge, no Oregon employer has been sued for having unvaccinated employees. But again, it could be a possibility if the employer made no effort, no attempt whatsoever to enforce the mandate in their workplace. And again, we're just talking about employers who are subject to the federal OSHA mandate of more than 100 employees. They're required either to have their employees be vaccinated or be tested, and they just do nothing. They take no effort and do nothing to enforce it and comply with it. You know, technically, you might be opening yourself up to some filing a complaint and having an issue when OSHA comes in to investigate. All right, so now that leads us to, uh, as we're kind of coming to the end, anything else we need to know? And I will say that I very rarely um, 
in a legal presentation in particular, use the word kind, <laughs> you know, not to say that I'm an unkind person. I'm sure Kyle would agree. I'm very fun to work with, um, but that's usually not part of the factor, right? But I will say just kind of circling back to my comment earlier about trying to mitigate lawsuits, trying to minimize liability. This is a pressure cooker situation um, on both sides. On the one hand, you have the employers, you have the city, Who's under pressure to comply with these mandates. It's confusing to know which mandate applies. Um, I saw there was a question in the chat that we'll get to afterwards, but a really good question and something to consider is what do you do when you have on the one hand the state mandate, if that applies to you, that doesn't require uh, or allow for testing, but then at the same time you have more than 100 employees, so the federal mandate does apply to you as well, and that does allow for testing, then what do you do in that situation? How do you reconcile those two? I mean, there's a lot of pressure on employers to figure out what to do here. Um, and at the same time, on the other hand, the employees are under pressure, right? Uh, if there is an employee who is vaccine hesitant for whatever reason, they're under pressure to receive medical treatment that's fraught for some of them. Um, you know, and let's just kind of keep in mind what the employees might be facing. They could be facing pressure from family, friends, faith communities. You know, they could be afraid, they could be misinformed. So, kindness, right? Try to treat them as kindly as possible. Um, I promise it will pay off in the long run for both you and your employees. Um, there are not easy questions to this. There's a lot to consider, um, but as just sort of guiding principles as we wrap up, we would say, keep in mind a lot of this is not brand new, right? When it comes to the religious exemption requests, you have the OSHA forms to help, and you also have the general framework of the interactive process. When it comes to ADA, Medical exemptions, same thing. This is like other requests before. Follow that guidance. Think about what reasonable accommodations might be possible. Think about whether remote work is possible. You know, there's a, a number of things you can consider. And if you really feel like you're hitting a dead end and banging your head against a brick wall, feel free to give me or Kyle or your other favorite employment lawyer a call and talk through these issues before you make your final decision because this is a new area and it's a fraught area. And with that, um, I will let Kyle close us out for any uh, final thoughts as we have our last minute. Uh, I would just say, echoing what Laura said, this is an uncertain time for everybody. We are figuring this out as we go in all phases. And so uh, a little grace goes a long way. Um, and, and that is litigation advice, not just um, you know human resources advice. Uh, we always find that uh, it is less likely that you find yourself in litigation hot water if you've done everything that you reasonably can for your employees um, before that happens. So with that, I, I'm not sure if we have time for uh, many questions, but uh, we'd sure like to answer them if we do. Uh, maybe Patty can tell us. I, I'm, I, so we do have some more. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we are at time. Um, I, I, I am, I was told by my boss that we need to cut it because we've got to get ready for our annual business meeting, which is on the same platform. But what I'd like to do, if it's okay, Laura and Kyle, if we can compose all the questions that came through in the chat and email them to you next week, can we then distribute your answers to attendees? Would that work? Absolutely. We'd be happy to do that. Okay, yeah. great. So uh, perfect. On behalf of the league, I want to thank Laura, Kyle, and their firm one more time. I've heard from some of you privately already that you enjoyed the presentation, but um, if you want to do virtual claps and thank them, I appreciate it. And I appreciate your firm very much for sponsoring this event. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.